I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who is uh, Michael Warner. He's an oste uh, uh, osteopathic doctor. As a graduate of Des Moines University College of Osteopathic Medicine, he's board certified in both family medicine and neuromusculature. Am I saying that? Neuromusculature. And I took a lot of Latin and I started saying <laughs> Skeletal medicine, osteopathic manipulative medicine. He was the founding chair of the Department of Osteopathic Principles and Practice when Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine opened a medical school here at Seton Hill University. Keep in mind, see, by the way, Seton Hill University, we all know who founded it, don't we? If you raise your hand, if you know who founded Seton Hill University. <laughs> Very good, the Sisters of Charity of Seton Hill, teaching us to be citizens of the world since 1809. Dr. Warner has provided medical care to the Evansburg, Johnstown, Pennsylvania area for over 20 years, which as we all know is the beautiful Laurel Highlands. Dr. Warner is a product of Catholic education. He attended an Augustinian prep school and an Augustinian college, Villanova University. He has degrees in biology and philosophy. That's interesting. As a doctor, patient, and certified professional coder, Dr. Warner foresaw the emergence of healthcare in the digital age. He co-wrote a guidebook with his physician wife, wait, <laughs> Margaret, <laughs> how to be your own patient advocate. Um, so we've been talking about, we've been getting, we've been going round and round about advocacy, personal advocacy, organizational advocacy, um, and legal and ethical advocacy. So here we have a patient advocate. So without further ado, I introduce to you Dr. Michael Warden. Thank you. I'm honored to be here today for your first annual Citizens of the World Conference and also to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the canonization of St. Stephen. Due to the digital age, unprecedented opportunities exist for you to seize the wellness that is available to you. I'm going to show you how to partner with your medical providers, to be a steward of your health record, to share in medical decision making, and to control the content of your health record, even to the point of being a co-author. In summary, you will be your own patient advocate. Wellness has various de definitions. Some try to separate you know, freedom from disease. What does that say for people that have a chronic disease? What does that say for people that are in an accident due to no fault of their own? State of complete physical, mental, social well-being, not merely absence of disease, still holding on to that concept. And then getting to the point of conscious, self-directed, and evolving process of achieving full potential. I think Satan Seton would have liked that definition. And a healthy balance of the mind, body, and spirit. I think she would agree with that too. Healthcare in the United States is not well. Quality wise, we rank number 42 for life expectancy out of 223 countries in the world. Infant mortality, the, 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 our babies, number 169. And the Commonwealth Fund last year did a mirror, mirror on the wall report comparing 11 countries for a whole list of quality measures, and we came in dead last. Satisfaction, we rank 66%. And what's interesting is that the report was most Americans remain satisfied with healthcare, with the way the healthcare system works for them, and we were able to boost out at 66%. And we spend the most. When we start spending 18 to 34 cents of every dollar on healthcare, all of a sudden, we don't have a money, enough money to spend for the needs of the people in our country and the needs, needs of the people in the world. When we have extra food, can we send it to other countries when we're spending so much on healthcare? Solutions 
are coming and will come with the digitalization of medical records. We'll have a single, non-fragmented, interoperable system where there's a one source of information so that everyone can communicate. It's designed to reduce errors and reduce duplication of services and allow for a new era of medicine where you have the federal right to view and amend your record. The use of electronic health records has grown rapidly. We started our first EHR in 2012, back when only 17% of doctors were using them in their offices. As of 2014, that number rose to 78%. And now as of 2015, if you do not use an EHR, you are finan financially penalized by the government. As far as meaningful use requirements, there's now patient portals that are becoming avail available, allowing you at any time to log in and look at your records. For now, you can usually see part of your records, but very soon, maybe within the next year or two, you will be able to look at every single part of your record, such as when you had that discussion with the nurse or with the doctor. Was it documented? Was it written down? Can you review it? Can you make sure it was accurate? Most of you, if you have anything to do with healthcare, or if you ever walked into a doctor's office and had to sign 3,000 forms, know about HIPAA. The Health Information Portability Accountability Act of 1996. I mean, we're going on 20 years there. HIPAA, most of us from signing these forms know that it has to do with security and privacy. But it was all meant so that you could someday view your records and amend them. All the security and privacy had to get to that point that you can enjoy these. And you have the federal right to view and amend. Now there's obstacles that are happening. These obstacles will drive you crazy. They'll drive you crazy as a patient and they'll drive you potentially even more crazy if you have anything to do with the health profession. The systems don't interoperate. You can see a doctor, they can type all the information into the computer, and by the time you get in the back of the office, they might not be communicating, let alone if you went across the street or went to another hospital, or heaven forbid, you went to another state or city. They're prone to hacking. You know, the whole idea that your information is going to be private is like saying the information on your Facebook is private. It's out there, and people can hack in and they can get it. That's another reason why you want to check your information and make sure it's accurate, because it might have got altered. Uh, lack of transparency, that's what's going on right now. If you were to look at your records through a patient portal, there's a chance you'll see your medication list, there's a chance you'll see your problem list, but all the details and all the discussions that were made and all the documentation, that's probably not available to you yet, but it will be very soon, because as a grassroots effort, uh, you're, you're going to start demanding to see your records. You know, when you leave a grocery store, you want to see your receipt. When you get your credit card bill in the mail, you want to go over it, make sure it's accurate. The same thing's going to start happening with medicine. And it'll be an about time kind of thing for the medical community if they're not ready for it. Errors. <clears throat> you wouldn't believe the amount of times that people will open an electronic chart, start typing things in about you, and it's in your chart. So if you check your records and you suddenly have diabetes or you had a stroke or something else, uh, there's a really good chance that uh, it was put into the wrong record. There are functions of the electronic health record like templates and copy forward. They're very useful, but it can also, it can, it can lead to, to information that's not accurate. We'll get reports back from specialists and there'll be nine or ten pages of the patient saying no to a whole list of problems. And the person will say, the guy was in there for two seconds. How could you have answered nine or ten pages of no and denying problems? And omissions. Omissions is the big one. You might go to the doctor and complain about three things. When you look at the note, you may find that none of those are documented in the record. And months later, you might go to the doctor and they might say, Doctors might say, well, you never complained about it. You said, I complained about it every time. It was never written down. And in the billing and coding word, world, much like the legal world, if it's not documented, it didn't happen. That's not in your favor. I've gotten to experience what life is like as a physician, and I've gotten to experience what life is like as a personal representative, taking care of family members who 
We've had our share of disease in our family. It's just happened. Hopefully we're taking on the burden for the rest of you healthy people. Three years ago, I gave a kidney to my son at uh, Montefiore Hospital. This was an event. Actually, this moment was quite an event because we, we at the lab said, oh, we have to have a picture. We jumped out of our beds, took the picture. Good thing I didn't turn around. And, and, we, and, and the staff was there tapping their, you know, come on, let's go, let's go. We literally took the picture, jumped into the beds, and went into the um, operating room suite. You know, people ask, what was it like? The hardest part for me, and we'll set up a consultation later on where I can sit on the couch and talk to you about this, Dr. <laughs> is uh, the hardest part with, to me was when I had to look at my nine-year-old son and know as a physician, that uh, his kidney function would decline. And there was a good chance as a child he would need another kidney and his, his kidneys would fail. Whole different kind of life for us. From the experience of, of going through life, wow, it was, it was powerful for us. It means a lot to us. It made us better people. It made us closer. But boy, it was trying. And we got to review a lot of medical records It's time for you to claim your right as your own patient advocate. You're a client of healthcare. You're not a victim of healthcare. You're a client of healthcare. I don't know why we, we refuse to, to look at it that way. Sure, medicine can be a business, but you should always be a client. We recommend that you look at your medical record before and after every visit, every medical encounter. Review it, know what's going on, be prepared, and review it afterwards to make sure that the documentation reflects what you went through. Also, there are opportunities where you can co-author your note. You know, it's kind of funny, it's hard for me to see the screen from here because <clears throat> a week before the kidney transplant, I was going through this, uh, this giant thing of, you know, what, what happens in a family practice office if I get sick? Because if I get sick, then a sick kidney is going to go to my son. So I was praying to God, to God, much the way Job lamented while I was loading tires onto a truck trying to get everything done. And I started having flashes in my eye, and I ended up tearing my retina and having to have surgery on it. So, uh, so I wasn't in the office for a week prior to the surgery, and I didn't get sick prior to it, which is why our 21-year-old son is probably doing so well right now. But I lost the vision in this eye, or most of it. So from this angle, I have to kind of run over here, and then run back here again. As I run over here, I run back here. Your, 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 your medical record is not just a memory note for the doctor. It's not just some piles of papers of information. It's a documentary of your life. It's a documentary of your life in health and sickness, going, going through, the, through the whole series of your life. And you really want to look at it that way and you want to treat it that way. When it comes down to the note, the history component is one of three key components to the medical encounter. There's the history, there's the exam, and there's the medical decision making. The history, the subjective history from you, was always meant from the 50s and 60s to be your words. It was supposed to be your words. Somewhere along the lines, it became some shorthand from the doctor to write stuff down, and you'd be amazed to see how that's transferred from what you say to what the doctor thinks you say. And sometimes you might go on and on about a bunch of things and the chart might say, you're doing fine, or you're doing well, or has some complaints, or maybe you're menopausal. <laughs> the history is comprised of the chief complaint, the uh, history of present illness, when did it start, what makes it better, what makes it worse, the status of chronic disease, like if you have diabetes, what are your sugar readings, do you check your feet, when did you see the eye doctor, are you having any problems with your medications? How are you feeling beyond the medications?
How are you feeling in general? The history of present illness is pretty much a head-to-toe inventory of your body. And there's a little list. Any problem here, any problem here, any problem here, going right down. Finally, we get to the fam past family social history, which has things like your medication list, if there's any updates dealing with family history. If you wanted to complete a, a, a prehistory prior to seeing your doctor, it would not be that hard. It would just be a matter of you telling your story and then documenting it. So, we were just about to open the patient portal in our own practice, and we knew that when we were open the portal, how would our patients respond to what they saw in the medical record? Would it be good enough? And if they had questions or wanted to make changes, how would we deal with it? So we started writing down the rule book, and it turned out to be a guidebook, a book that we wrote and published. We created a not-for-profit agency called Patient Advocacy Initiatives, so that everything we do is free online for whoever wants it, including educational tutorial videos, teaching people how to do this and why it's important. Not only teaching patients, but teaching physicians and nurses, front desk, checkout window, everybody involved on how this process can work, so that your story can be heard and documented into the medical record, with chances of being understood by people who are providing your care. We then conducted a research study that just ended yesterday, where we sent packets of prehistories uh, forms out to patients and invited them to co-author their notes when they visited me. We, uh, we, I put on here 200 patients. I, I just ran the numbers this morning. It's 258 patients uh, participated over a two-month period. And what we did is we did surveys with staff members, all the staff members, and the patients, including the patients doing the survey before they did the prehistory and after they did the prehistory. The before, most of them were very uh, you know, supportive. Yeah, this is a good idea. Afterwards, everything went the other way. They were happy with their records. They got to review it. They liked the completeness of it. They liked the detail of the office visit. They felt like all their needs were addressed. And they felt like a long time was spent with them. Really, a long time wasn't spent with them. It's just that they were prepared, they came in, you could look at the information. For me, reading somebody's prehistory was like we had sat down and talked for 15 minutes. The anxiety of trying to remember things or trying to communicate was completely gone. We could just sit down and we could communicate. That kind of sounds a little bit like wellness I'm not making. <laughs> This is more of things. The common theme we got back from patients was that they would take this information, the, the prehistory form, and they would look at it over several days. They would reflect over the content. They would reflect over their questions or their answers that they would write down, and they would prepare for the visit. Some patients feel that with this question, you know, when people come in, what's going on, what's going on? And every single member you see keeps asking the same questions. And it just feels like you're worn out by the time the, the provider walks in the room. This takes that all away. In a way, we have to redefine the roles of everyone. The patient isn't somebody who suffers, but the patient's a client. And an advocate isn't someone who is pleading for someone who's suffering, but an advocate is someone who is supporting themselves, telling their story, and making sure they're heard. It's certainly a paradigm shift in healthcare, which uh, from Thomas Kuhn, who is a philosopher, physicist, scientist, in 1962, actually coined the term paradigm shift. He has this great saying of uh, new ways only, only are accepted once the old way miserably fails. And I think if we go around and ask people stories, there's a lot of failures that we've seen in healthcare and a lot of opportunities that we can improve things. I'm gonna go over here so I can see. <clears throat> in my readings of St. Elizabeth Ann Seton, I saw words happen over and over again. Words like devoted, practical, perseverance, courage, intention, intention, intention. What would St. Seton say regarding your God-given body, mind, and spirit? What would she say? 
You know, being a philosophy major, that's what we had to do all the time. You know, we had to answer these questions. And she, she made comments about prayer, the efficacy of prayer. And she basically say that it's the disposition of the one who prays that can weaken or even obstruct the efficacy or the power of prayer. So I think she was turning it around a little bit to say when we pray, that we have to make sure that we do it in certain ways and use certain powerful words to make it happen. And probably some of that happens on the medical side too, as patients. We shouldn't be the passive recipient of care, but we should be the proactive person, the empowered person, someone who can take charge of their health and health care to promote wellness. Active role, be heard and understood, be the steward of your documentation, to strive to understand and to participate in shared decision making with your provider. With wellness, you can be your own patient advocate. Preparing for this, I think St. Seton really helped me because when we, when we pull out some of these questions as far as how are we going to change healthcare, how are we going to improve healthcare, how are we going to promote wellness, I think she gave us good words on what to do. And I think it's all a matter of us trying to improve the efficacy of our healthcare, much the way she wanted us to improve the efficacy of our prayer. Thank you. Wow.